Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Emma said, I'm Peter Brinsden, and um, I am a, an enthusiastic wildlife photographer. I've been on several uh, photographers' uh, wildlife trips to the Arctic and the Antarctic and Kenya and one or two others, and I lecture on China and Japan quite frequently, and I'm a bit of a Nelson nerd too, hence the white ensign in the back background. Um, I thought just very briefly, I'd, I'd just uh, think about uh, the this situation. I got the, this uh, in the post this afternoon, so I thought I'd show it off, Ukraine and UK, uh, showing sympathy for our dear neighbors in Ukraine. So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about my delightful uh, uh, trip to Galapagos. Um, it was, in fact, 10 years ago now. It doesn't seem that long. Um, and uh, the huge uh, enjoyment you get from very close association with the wildlife there. So Galapagos, as most of you will know, is situated off the... Uh, can you see my pointer, Emma? Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. yes. Uh, it's off the west coast of Ecuador and um, is a group of islands here. Um, initially discovered in uh, 1535 by Bishop uh, Balanga, um, and he called it the island of the tortoises in Spanish. And of course, uh, most uh, um, highlighted and, and became famous after Charles Darwin's uh, On the Origin of Species book. Um, we had the most amazing time there, but we most people come into Quito uh, first, the capital of Ecuador, and I'll just show you a few pictures of this fascinating city. And we then flew down to Guayaquil and then across to Galapagos. So Quito, Guayaquil and Galapagos. And Quito is a beautiful place, uh, a really beautiful city with really uh, interesting colonial architecture. Uh, one slight snag for me with cardiac problems, it's about two miles above sea level. And with a bit of exertion, you could definitely uh, notice. And it was uh, just a few months before I had my triple heart bypass. So it wasn't surprising. I'd probably be all right now, hopefully. Um, it's a, a beautiful city um, with, as I say, beautiful architecture. Uh, on the edge of the city, it's got this amazing statue, and it's called the Virgin del Panicello. Panicello, I think it's the way you pronounce it. Um, and uh, I'm going to put the view down there. Um, it's the tallest aluminium statue in the world. I didn't know it was made of aluminium at the time. And the tallest winged representation of the Virgin Mary. Um, uh, fascinating views from there of Quito. Uh, from the heights there, looking out over the city of this previously Spanish uh, city. The people are lovely. Uh, the local people are lovely, lots of colour, and they dress quite colourfully as well. Um, it's interesting that it's on the equator, um, as you might know. And I went on this trip with a very, very close friend of mine, uh, who did what I do, this was me, um, beardless on this occasion, um, uh, in Sydney, Australia. So he and I no, not yet. firm friends, and he ran a, a very successful IVF unit in Australia. Very, very sadly, he died uh, about three or four years ago um, uh, of a cancer, uh, a great loss. And he was um, quite a lot younger than me as well. Standing on the equator, everyone always does it. That's the line of the equator there, and um, everyone stands on it. And it's said that it's very difficult if you walk along the equator to keep your balance. I think it's a bit of a myth, but I must admit I struggled a bit. But they said it was, uh, the local guide said it was impossible to maintain your balance. Um, another interesting thing is, which some of you may know, is the fact if you're north of the equator, the water will go out of your basin in a clockwise way, in a clockwise way. And if you're south of the equator, 
about eight, ten feet away from these two basins, oh, I'm sorry, um, you will find it going the other way. And they were literally separated by about ten feet. Now, I don't know what to make of that. I find it very difficult to believe that a line in the sand uh, makes that much difference, but that's what they showed us. We went up into the forests of Ecuador um, near Quito, um, and I've got several pictures of forest, uh, which I'm not showing, but uh, saw quite a lot of hummingbirds there. Very difficult to get a hummingbird without a, a feeder because there are vast numbers of feeders up there. Eventually, we went to uh, uh, flew across to Galapagos. Um, Charles Darwin himself said the natural history of these islands is eminently curious and well deserves attention. Both in space and time, we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. And so uh, evolved the uh, idea of evolution. And he went there in uh, H.R.S. Beagle, um, being ex-Navy myself, I'm very enthusiastic about naval history. Uh, Captain Robert Fitzroy is a, a very interesting chap in his own right. And the weather area was named after Fitzroy originally until a few years ago. Um, and they visited uh, during the period September, October, 1835. And Beagle wandered around uh, Galapagos uh, like that, apparently. It's quite well recorded. Um, and uh, that is uh, where, and if any of you have seen my favorite film, Master and Commander, um, you'll have seen some interesting bits of uh, Galapagos. Um, a very interesting geological feature about the Galapagos Islands is that they are situated on a, a big tectonic plate, in fact, two tectonic plates, and they're situated between them. And what happen, is happening is that the volcanoes, the uh, area of the tectonic plate occur, and uh, the islands are moving eastwards by about two inches a year, which in geological terms is a, is a very fast movement. And as the years go by, or centuries, or, or, or millennia go by, you will find these islands furthest to the east degrade and become flat and eventually submerge, and new islands uh, form, and they gradually form like that. And I think that's a fascinating fact. The whole of those islands here are moving eastwards by a whole two inches a year. Um, so we uh, came in uh, to Bolcher, where the airport is, and, and took off from here and, and went up and up and up and around and around and around and back again. And I'm going to take you there, almost entirely concentrating on the wildlife, um, which is absolutely extraordinary. This was our boat, only 10 of us uh, passengers. The smaller your group, the better, especially if you're all there with all your photographic equipment and mine's longer than yours type lenses and um, equipment that us photographers tend to cart around with us. We went around the place in these uh, ribs, rigid inflatable boats and um, uh, dined in here and our, our cabins were under here. Very comfortable, delightful trip. We had a, a wonderful crew and a local guide, and we had a photographic expert come guide this chap here. And we would wander around to visit the islands. We'd anchor off and visit the islands. Um, and uh, they are all topographically look very different indeed. So we island hopped around, uh, as I showed you. This is the group here, uh, our, our local guide, Sorry, I keep um, my my mouse is um, clicking. Our, our local guide, myself, my very good friend. No, our local guide there, uh, uh, another uh, guide there, and our pho photographer expert there. 
as us anchored off. We saw very few other boats. Uh, this is the first beach we came ashore on, pristine white sands and um, looking for wildlife. And it soon turns up uh, an oyster catcher. I'm a bird watcher as well, so oyster catcher. It was, I think, the first picture I took of wildlife on, on the island. Um, and exactly the same oyster catcher as you get. These delightful creatures are Sally Lightfoot crabs, which scamper around the rocks and into the rock pools. And they have this amazing color. Um, uh, they look really amazing, especially when they're wet and shiny. And um, they can climb rocks uh, uh, amazingly well, and they scamper across the water. They're able to actually walk on water. You can see this one here, another one just walking on the water across to there. Uh, quite astonishing to see them scampering across like that. This is a blue-footed booby. Uh, you can see why it's called a blue-footed booby, obviously. The other reason I show this is everywhere you see these fascinating layers upon layers upon layers of volcanic rock, um, signifying different stages and years of, of eruptions, continuous eruptions, one upon the other. And it's absolutely fascinating to see if you're interested in geology. Um, these frigate birds are amazing creatures. They look quite, quite uh, uh, um, Quite unusual, quite almost uh, well, un unusual they are in their looks. They look quite spooky in some ways. This is the captain when we crossed the equator um, here again. And you can see there um, crossing the equator there, a smashing trap the captain was, and very obliging, allowing us up onto the um, bridge and so on. We went to uh, um, Genovesa Island, one of the early islands we went to. Uh, this is a, a real sanctuary, fairly isolated up the north part of the archipelago. And here is a <coughs> print, what's called Prince Philip's Steps. Um, and they were sort of dug in there to, for when Prince Philip visited um, some decades ago. And uh, we climbed up there to the top. Um, And there was a large colony of frigate birds. Uh, these are the males, of course, they are magnificent. And when fully puffed up, they think they are really pretty gorgeous. So they know they're really pretty gorgeous. I mean, look at that chap. He is, he would have difficulty eating his dinner, I would have thought, but um, he knows he's, he's gorgeous. And I think they're gorgeous as well. Good place to rest your chin too. And the ladies, I'm afraid, are pretty dowdy, really. And these chaps trying to show off to their lady friends and uh, making real effort, all driven by testosterone. Um, these marine iguanas are ten a penny. There are thousands of them. And from a distance, you, it's difficult to spot them from the lava rock. Um, they are pretty disgusting. Uh, to look at, but they are fascinating creatures. And if you get too close to them, they will snort, snot at you, salt water snot at you, because they excrete the salt by excreting it, expelling it through their nostrils. And they will often aim it at you if you get too close. Not a very pleasant experience, but uh, very ugly, very docile. And of course, they spend quite a lot of time, A, trying to get warmed up in the sunshine and then underwater where they feed. Uh, this is a, a Galapagos penguin here, the smallest penguin. And way, way north of the normal territory for penguins, uh, they don't normally come that far north. And they are an exclusive species to Galapagos, uh, the Galapagos Islands. Uh, with some marine iguanas. You give you a sort of relative, the penguins probably about 18 to 20 inches tall. Slightly out of focus because I was 
snorkeling at the time and bobbing up and down. I thought this was a, a, a nice piece of uh, cactus, unusual shape. It sort of reminded me of some sort of prehistoric. The word I was trying to think of with the frigate birds was prehistoric. It reminded me of some sort of prehistoric creature fighting another one. Um, and there's quite a lot of growth on parts of the island and other parts of the islands uh, are um, very uh, barren indeed. This is the famous flightless cormorant that uh, Darwin got so uh, worked up about. And you can see why they're flightless. Um, they don't need the wings. They use those as flippers, really, because they feed underwater, as you will see later on. Uh, not a very um, striking bird, but absolutely amazing to watch underwater. So we would walk uh, around uh, the different islands um, with our long lenses, as you can see, and our bits of camera kit on this uh, very difficult terrain, very rocky volcanic terrain. And you'll see several examples of the sort of land we were walking on. And you can see here the sort of the way the lava had flowed uh, when it first erupted out of the volcano and uh, then solidified. And walking on this is not easy at all. I got through a pair of uh, shoes, rubber soled shoes, very quickly tears them up a bit. Um, various growths, a bit of grass, some cacti, which do flower quite uh, prettily. Uh, uh, seasonally. Lots of nice sunsets. You'll see a couple during this talk. Um, pretty sunsets out and we're anchored out for our evening meal. And again, this rather reptilian uh, bird flying around us looking for its supper. Uh, sometimes the crew would throw the fish heads and things over the side. Uh, one of the islands we visited the mangrove swamps. Now, those of you who are interested in the ecology and the climate change and so on will know that mangrove swamps are one of the very, very best carbon sinks of all. A lot, lot better than your average tree. I think, I can't remember the exact fee, one of you may know, um, uh, something like 15 times the absorption rate of, a, uh, of an average uh, tree. And we are uh, going around, we've got turtles in the water here and um, all with our big lenses and things, exploring the mangrove swamps. Absolutely an incredible plant because it's surviving in salt water. Uh, and um, the tides go in and out uh, and cover it more or less. And it is also a very valuable school um, or nursery, should I say, for smaller fish away from the predators. The predators can't get in amongst all this tangle, whereas the small fish can stay safely amongst it and uh, grow to bigger sizes. Uh, the great heron, the great blue heron in this case, uh, live among the mangroves, uh, I suppose partly because there are plenty of small fish there. Uh, one of the predators that the small fish have to cope with, but he's, uh, an attractive looking bird. And then a smart, much smaller lava heron, um, also in the mangrove swamps. Now this is one of my favorite birds from Galapagos, the swallow-tailed gulls. Um, they have these big eyes uh, and red rimmed eyes and, and beautiful plumage. I mean, look at that, the most gorgeous bird. And their chick here, well camouflaged chick, because they lay a, they don't really have a nest, they just have a little dip in the gravel, what is sort of stony gravel there. But very well camouflaged uh, chicks um, there, and such attractive parents there. I couldn't resist putting another one in. Lovely portrait. 
Now these are there are three species of booby in 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 the uh, Galapagos Islands. Um, there's the the Nazca, which are grey-footed, the blue-footed, and the red-footed. You'll meet in a minute. Again, a very attractive bird with less attractive uh, footwear. Thinking he looks, he thinks he looks rather handsome. I think, and indeed he does. And with their own chick. Again, they tend to use a scraping rather than a, a full nest. <clears throat> and you can see how, in this picture with my chum there in the front, you can see how unconcerned they are. And this is typical, and uh, as you'll see later as well, uh, of how little they care about us. Because there are no predators, no real predators there uh, on the islands. And so they, they come up and curious. It's a bit like um, the penguins in the Antarctic when I was down there. They would come up within six feet or less of you and sort of look at you like this and, hmm, yes, okay, and wander off again. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, another portrait of a, a blue footed booby. booby. And this is quite impressive to watch. Uh, we were in the dinghies here. This is a bit noisy. So um, it, there was a lot of wind blowing uh, into the microphone of the camera. So, but I think this is fascinating. I've got several shots of this. Sometimes they're, they're all in a line, and like a line of dive bombers, Tuka dive bombers or something, going to da 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 in the water. How they don't spear each other with their big sharp beaks like that, I, I don't know. Now these are red-footed boobies, uh, two females here. At least I think they're both females. Rather beautiful coloring, um, and their red feet, they make them very uh, distinguished looking. This was one of the more beautiful birds as well, a tropic bird, and for some reason called bosun birds, I think because they were a sign of uh, land being near. Um, but uh, this, well, this one was taken near Prince Philip Steps, and very long tail, an absolutely beautiful bird. Difficult to catch in flight because they're so quick. The Galapagos dove is quite a well-known um, uh, um, bird on Galapagos and is unique to Galapagos. And um, uh, again, they're very attractive. They have these very attractive eyes and red feet. Uh, occasionally on some of our overnight uh, anchorages, we would be visited by local fishermen delivering our fresh fish supper. Um, and uh, he had a boatload of fresh fish. He's cutting it up there for us and feeding the frigate birds. They know they're going to get supper here, feeding the frigate bird with all the entrails and heads and so on, tails and so on. So they get a good meal, we get a good meal, and they earn a bit of money. I think that's a good symbiotic relationship. Another nice sunset with our fishermen friends just departing. Again, frigate birds would circle around us of an evening and uh, uh, during the sunset views would really look quite primeval to me. And that's why I use it as my lead slide. One very early morning I was up and this pod of dolphins uh, in convoy passing by, all synchronized swimmers. Um, I, can't, I think they're common dolphins. I, I'm not very good on classifying dolphins. And this is just to show the sort of topography, the old volcano in the distance there, and the old lava flow coming down like that, and here the lava. And you'd think this was rocks, wouldn't you? But this is a colony of iguanas there. Uh, 
barely distinguishable from the rocks. And I just like the old logs and things there, uh, been washed in from the sea during gales, probably. Um, a really nice, peaceful setting. Uh, 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 an iguana with a Sally Lightfoot crab there. And occasionally you'd come across the skeleton of a, of a tortoise, um, sadly, uh, but inevitable, and um, lying on the beach. Again, the rugged terrain, we had to walk around. These fissures once would have been um, down through the to the fresh lava flowing in the canyons below, and the walking over this rugged territory was tough going. So this is quite barren here, and yet with patches of green, as you can see there, um, and you can see why we got through a pair of uh, rubber shoes. Now, this is another species unique to Galapagos, um, the Galapagos hawk, a beautiful, beautiful creature. You'll see a few pictures of him. Very difficult to catch in flight because um, the to catch, to, I had to brighten it up so I lost the sky to get the coloring of the hawk. Um, now this chap was very, Obliged to present me with a profile, and he would present me with a, a, a left view and a right view, and um, he gave me every pose that he had in the book. And I think this is a very elegant picture of a Galapagos hawk. And he was totally unfazed. I was probably no more than eight feet away from him. Um, and with a zoom lens, I could have just got his head in uh, uh, as well. And you can see in my next slide how unconcerned he is. He moved on to this old rock here. The, this young couple were very enthusiastic photographers. And they are, what, within three, four feet of him. And he's just sitting there posing for the photographers. And that, I think, is an archetypal type picture idea, gives you an, a, an idea of how unconcerned, as I've said already, uh, the wildlife are, wildlife is for uh, humans. Again, a, a, a fur seal, um, we're all standing there, clicking away, totally unconcerned, but again, posing for us. Um, as you'll see, these were giving me their left profiles. These are a, a pair of younger ones with the mother here. Um, absolutely gorgeous, sleek, uh, creatures and very playful as well. Uh, they look as if they're mating, but they're not. I think they're brother and sister together. These are young, relatively young fur seals playing happily. More rugged terrain to walk over on a different island. Another skeleton. Uh, probably a minke whale, I think. Um, I came across a lot of close encounters of minke whale in, in Antarctica, and it's about the right size for a minke. Very sad to see, but beautiful. And of course, you're not allowed to take anything off the islands at all, but um, these, that was probably about 15 inches. Sorry, I'm in, in old language, but probably about 30 centimeters tall something like that, bleached white by the bright sunlight. And we came on one of the islands, I can't remember which one, across the remains of a World War II American radar station. So from way out there in, uh, in the mid-Pacific, they could um, keep an eye on uh, various goings on and the risks of invasion to uh, um, uh, to different parts of South America and even middle, um, uh, the uh, middle Americas. So walking inland away from the coast, um, you came to a completely different sort of uh, um, biology. The, the undergrowth was quite different. 
and the iguanas were quite difficult, different. These are land iguanas, equally ugly, but a different color. And they are land feeders. Obviously, they feed off the land vegetation as opposed to the marine iguanas who feed off the vegetarian on the bed of the, on the rocks and things in, in the sea. Lovely little fellow, this cheeky little fellow gave us the pose as well. I was probably two, three, three feet away. And um, he would uh, just sit there posing, but bathing, basking in the sunshine, really. Uh, a lava lizard, they call it, beautifully colored. Those of you who saw um, the wildlife program on series on uh, Galapagos will have seen the racing snakes, race her snakes, uh, trying to catch a new baby iguana. <laughs> Quite the most astonishing film footage I think I've ever seen. Uh, if you've never seen it, it's one of David Attenborough's brilliant series on, uh, on the Galapagos Islands. And these are very long indeed. He was probably eight feet long, I suppose, uh, total. Um, and that was the only one I came across. But if you saw the wildlife film of them, they were just pouring out of different rocks, crevices, uh, trying to chase this baby lizard who made it in the end. And of course, you've got the uh, Galapagos giant tortoises. Uh, amazing creatures, just gorgeous. Very slow, very ponderous, couldn't care less. I must admit he would with pull his head in when he, when he saw me, but who wouldn't when they saw me with my camera and everything else. Um, and uh, very plodding there is, he decided he would pose for me in the end. And he is within three feet of me, I suppose, at the time. He's curious about me. I'm curious about him. And that's one of the great, great delights of visiting these islands. Quite a handsome looking fellow, a Galapagos pelican. Uh, those with the pre name, the forename of Galapagos pelican, Galapagos hawk, Galapagos penguin. They're all unique species to these islands. Um, we then visited uh, a, a tortoise sanctuary. And um, like uh, as, as Emma told you, I've, I've been trying to get ladies pregnant for the last 30 years through IVF and assisted fertility treatments. And um, to see sort of uh, uh, an IVF equivalent center for tortoises was, uh, was really quite exciting. They don't in fact do IVF. Uh, tortoises, are loads of baby tortoises, they incubate the eggs um, uh, rather than letting them try and do it on their own because the success rate is not very high naturally. Um, but in this, uh, and they're trying to reintroduce them to various islands that have lost them. Um, this is, uh, uh, tortoises trying to do it the natural way. You look a very cumbersome process does uh, mating in, in the tortoise world. Um, a lot of grunting goes on, but um, uh, they are successful and they produce a number of eggs and these little chaps uh, turn up. The, you've, those of you who've read about Darwin and read about Galapagos Islands uh, will know about the finch story. Some th people say rather too much is made of them, but there are several different species of finch on um, the islands and they are often different from in, on the different islands, uh, which uh, fascinated Darwin. And they mainly tell from the beaks themselves. Um, this is a, a, a Darwin finch with a much longer be uh, bill than this one. There's a stubbier finch and so, some have even stubbier finches. I must admit, I didn't come across or get any really good pictures of uh, the different finch species, but this is just two of them. And this is not a bull bull. Um, I couldn't work out what it was and I couldn't find it in the local book, 
but a friend very kindly looked it up for me. In fact, after last year's lecture, and he found it online and told me what it was, and I forgot to change the, uh, put it in here where I should have done, I must do that. But what an attractive bird. And look, look at the um, way he blends into the, come on, the way he blends into the uh, surrounding with the flowers and his coloring there. Absolutely gorgeous looking bird. This is a, ch a chap called the Galapagos Mockingbird. Um, and I think he got his name because I think there's one in a, a similar species in America and they sort of dart in and out and they, they, one minute you see them and the next minute they've gone, they've hidden in the undergrowth. But this one allowed, uh, gave me a pose just very briefly and then darted off. Um, not a very attractive bird, but uh, an interesting bird um, by habit. <clears throat> In one of the reserves, uh, we came across some um, indigenous pink flamingos, not very many of them, but again, a very attractive bird. Um, I thought that was rather a nice sign. Uh, Iguana crossing, please drive slowly. Um, we then went up a, a, a very well-known uh, uh, volcano, uh, the um, Sierra Negra volcano, uh, the Spanish call them calderas, maybe we do, maybe geologists do as well. And we were there in 2011, and on the 22nd of October 2005, so six years previously, was the last uh, eruption. And we climbed from the base of this volcano, <coughs> again, me huffing and puffing a bit with my, and having chest pain. Um, not much in the way of medical facilities had I had a heart attack, but that's another story. Um, and we got to the top of the caldera, and this is the rim of the volcano, which was, I think, a mile and a half or two miles across, so, uh, an amazing distance. Um, and there's us uh, all having made it to the top. And this is the lava left from the last eruption. Um, and it wasn't bubbling away at the time, um, but I believe it was hot. Uh, you couldn't go down there. We also had the opportunity of uh, snorkeling. Uh, although I'm a, a very keen diver and have dived in many places around the world, um, this was not a diving expedition, so I couldn't do any diving. But we snorkeled in amongst the rocks and coves um, two or three times, uh, which was fun. Quite a heavy sea going here. Um, and these are pretty awful pictures, but my little underwater camera was all it, this was all it could cope with, I'm afraid, but a lot of fish life, and I would love to have been able to dive with the fish life. Uh, a lot of the fur seals um, uh, kept coming up and looking at us, peering at us, and then darting off again. Um, my camera just couldn't cope with the speed they were moving among the rocks, but I unashamedly put these in because they're the only examples I've got without resorting to internet pictures. And he'd uh, dart round and then we'd both come up for a bit of air and he'd look at me and I'd look at him and share these magic moments that you get with these close encounters, being about eight, ten feet away maybe. Uh, there's a turtle there and, and the ribs went into this huge cave there and there was a squadron of, uh, uh, there's another turtle, green turtle, I think. That's taken underwater, that's why they're not very good pictures. But that's a better one, a bit closer. And there was a, a squadron, I call it, of golden cow nose rails, they're rays. They're called cow nose because they have this sort of blunt nose to them. And these are probably about three feet across, two and a half, three feet across. And a great squadron of them went by our, while I was um, snorkeling there. Um, delight to see. I've swum with, uh, uh, dived with giant mantas and sharks and things and 
but I've seldom seen so many all at once, all at the same time. So flightless cormorants, um, I'm going to show you uh, how they behave underwater. I think this is probably the most astonishing uh, bit of the uh, talk. These, remember, are birds. They are flightless and they rely on the algae and the little creatures that live in all the rocks and crevices. And I'm going to hope that this uh, works. There's a bit of bubbling noise goes on. So this is him on the surface and then he's bobbed down. I keep apologizing for the quality. But, uh, on a single breath, he stays under there a lot longer than I can stay under. I emphasize encourage you to remember that this is a bird. He comes up and I come up and we meet at the top. I think that is truly astonishing to me anyway. So I've taken you round, uh, taken you round the Galapagos. I took about 1500 slides, pictures, uh, and I've only shown you a tiny portion of those. Uh, I've tried to show you a wide a sample of some of the uh, creatures that we came across. For me, it was one of the most thrilling uh, 10 days of, of my time. Um, and I, uh, apart from South Georgia and Antarctica, which were, and Kenya, of course, and the Arctic, but they were all equally thrilling in their own ways. But to get so close, to uh, the God's wild creatures is just an amazing experience. So uh, we um, had on our last night a little party on board and they got into their best whites. This is the captain here, a really lovely fellow. And the cooks, the cook here, uh, he did produce some really good food in a tiny little galley. And that's the captain and I saying goodbye um, to the Samba and her crew, truly memorable uh, experience. A very happy bunny I was. However, having said all that, and it was a, such a, a pleasure, there are real problems and dilemmas just to finish off in the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the number of residents has increased hugely um, uh, in, in the last uh, decades especially, um, and the number of visitors has es escalated. Um, Almost, that's 14,000, I think, that figure there. And this is 20,000 population here from virtually none uh, in the early years. Um, and this is a big problem, the number of visitors uh, that they can cope with. So the amount of waste and garbage and pollution and everything that um, 14,000, that's 140,000, sorry, 140,000, visitors uh, make. There are several smallish hotels on the islands, a couple of the islands. And the amount of pollution all has to be taken off the islands and back to the mainland is uh, uh, awful. So that's um, my time in Galapagos. Uh, these reptilian um, birds, which I love so much, uh, really give it atmosphere in the evening sunsets. Um, and uh, I thank Galapagos, the Enchanted Islands, and thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions, if you have any. Oh, just to say, John Baines is running three tours. Emma thought I could stick this in briefly at the end. Um, there's one trip, is, is that still going? Uh, that's going ahead, uh, Emma. She's going to switch on her voice in a minute. Um, and they've got two more, two more trips, uh, three more trips coming up. Um, the dentists are going off. Uh, there's not many places left there. And then uh, one later on in the year and one uh, next year. So Ecuador was fascinating. Galapagos, owned by Ecuador, is fascinating. And I strongly, strongly recommend it uh, as a place to visit. Put on your bucket list. Um, thank you very much for listening.